जय राध माधव जय कुंज बिहारी जय राध माधव जय कुंज बिहारी जय गोपी जन वल्लभ गिरिवर धारी जय गोपी जन वल्लभ गिरिवर धारी यशोदानंदन व्रज जन रंजन यशोदानंदन व्रज जन रंजन यमुना पीर वन यमुना तीर वन जय राध माधव जय कुंज बिहारी हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे जय राधा श्याम सुंदर राधा श्याम सुंदर राधे जय कृष्ण बल राम कृष्ण बल राम कृष्ण बल राम जय कृष्ण बल राम जय गौरानिताय 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 जय गौरानिताय जय जय प्रभुपाद 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 जय श्रील प्रभुपाद हरिणाम संकीर्तन की जय श्रीमद भागवतम की जय श्रील प्रभुपाद की जय हरे कृष्णा थैंक यू ऑल फॉर ज्वाइनिंग आई थिंक वी ओनली बी टुडे लोग सो डज एनी वन रिमेम्बर वॉट वी डिड लास्ट वीक प्रभु टूक a kind of a map number of verses yesterday uh, last week almost 12 verses he took uh, anyone... yeah, prabhu uh, uh, on summary basically we studied uh, uh, which devi god uh, we need to worship to get a specific benefit hmm. so each uh, each devi god wise we saw what are the benefits we will get it then after that one uh, we understood that one whether we have a uh, Uh, material desire or do not have the desire, but still uh, we need to worship the the supreme personality of the Godhead. Correct. So uh, obviously, uh, this transcendental uh, uh, activity and and worship is uh, do not have any uh, any attachment of uh, material desires. So it is impossible that somebody would not get attracted to this one. Mm. very very important so uh, the key point that comes out of the whole thing is uh, meaning to give go a little into a background see when a disciple or when somebody approaches a guru with the expectation of becoming a disciple the disciple tastes uh, sorry the guru tastes the disciple yeah of course the disciple also has the right to test the guru but he has already tasted after which he has, he has made a decision that yes this guru is whom i would like to you know go in for and i would like to become his disciple and then he approaches the guru so when that disciple approaches the guru and the guru decides to test him initially the guru uh, depending on the ap- approach of the disciple and the level of the disciple he will give certain activities and he will test him and see whether he is right to actually start on this path or he needs different kind of education similarly when uh, parikshit maharaj submits himself to uh, shukadev goswami and asks this question what a person is supposed to do he does not tell him in the kind of the conclusion 
what a person is supposed to do at the beginning itself. He gives him different kind of you know medicine. उसको टेस्ट करते हैं बार बार तो अभी दिस इज दैट वन ऑफ द स्टेप्स ऑफ टेस्टिंग तो परमात्मा रिलेटेड स्टफ ही स्पोक अबाउट इन चैप्टर टू देन अटोनमेंट रिलेटेड स्टफ ही स्पोक अबाउट इन चैप्टर वन ओके एंड नाउ ही इज टेलिंग हिम अबाउट वर्शिपिंग द डेमी गॉड्स सो ऑल दैट यू सी हियर फ्रॉम वर्स नंबर टू टू सेवन ओके इज एक्चुअली रिलेटेड विथ इधर मटीरियल प्लेशर्स or at the most the brahma jyoti related stuff okay but wherever vishnu has come it is more from a spiritual advancement otherwise whether it is mani uh, manus or whatever it is he has uh, talked about from a material benefit perspective only and that is where then he talks about this particular verse which is a very very important verse akamah sarva kamo va moksha kama udaradhi तीव्रेण भक्ति योगेन यजेत पुरुषम परम मीनिंग इरेस्पेक्टिव ऑफ व्हाट इज युअर एक्सपेक्टेशन फ्रॉम द लॉर्ड यू शुड वर्शिप द सुप्रीम लॉर्ड विष्णु कृष्ण ये पुरुषम परम व्हाय बिकॉज एनीबडी कैन यू मेंशन व्हाट डू यू थिंक इज द रीजन बिहाइंड इरेस्पेक्टिव ऑफ युअर स्टेज एंड द लेवल ऑफ युअर डिझायर यू शुड वर्शिप विष्णु what is the reason why is he saying so because that is the ultimate okay to fir matlab kya hota hai usse in order to actually and... stop the cycle of life and death okay theek hai but and fir... go back to the supreme god head okay but then that is correct but uh, a person without any material desire may want to worship vishnu or a person may who wants desire, liberation may want to worship vishnu based on the points that you have said which is perfectly fine but if a person has full of material desires okay usko to shukar even wo bol raha hai ki usko shukar ko karna chahiye to wo karega agar vishnu ki worship to what is the benefit he will get yeah even uh, even then the, whatever his desires are will get fulfilled from the same supreme lord तो तो डेमिगॉड्स विल आल्सो फुलफिल तो डिफरेंस क्या है दोनों में प्रभु जी ही इज लक्ष्मीपति सो ऑल द डिजायर्स विल बी फुलफिल्ड बिकॉज़ ऑफ गॉडेस लक्ष्मी दैट शुड बी द आंसर नहीं तो आई आई डोंट केयर लाइक से फॉर एग्जांपल मनी इंस्टेड ऑफ हां इंस्टेड ऑफ एक्चुअली वर्शिपिंग मेनी डेमिगॉड्स इट इज अल्टीमेटली Uh, all the demigods are working or all are doing things based on the direction of the supreme lord correct so instead of actually going through the demigods the uh, reference here is to go to the supreme lord so anyways you will have instead of doing multiple you can do it from one correct but then for example let's say i want 100 dirhams i don't care where uday prabhu gives to me directly or uday prabhu gives to me by rao prabhu हंड्रेड ग्राम्स तो हंड्रेड ग्राम्स ही है ना सो प्रभु जी एक्चुअली डेमी गॉड्स आर हैव द पावर जस्ट टू एड्रेस द डिजायर बट इफ यू वर्शिप द कृष्णा लेटर इल मेक यू फ्री फ्रॉम दिस मेटेरियल डिजायर इल पुट यू इन टू द राइट पाथ ओके सो देर आर या विच इज विच इज करेक्ट सो देर आर टू प्राइमरी रीजन वाई वर्शिपिंग डेमी गॉड्स is uh, i would say three primary reasons but one is not such an important uh, why why demigod worship is not recommended the first is what we have uh, uh, learnt in bhagavad gita that one demigod cannot give what the other demigod can give okay but if i have the inclination to worship more than one demigod and achieve wh- whatever i want to then i wouldn't care whether demigod number 2 cannot give or can give i will worship both of them and get whatever i want but the two other primary reasons are firstly when i go to the demigod for asking something the demigods will not bother to know whether i deserve it or not and secondly is it beneficial for me for my spiritual growth or not so the question of want and need is not addressed by them if my son comes to me and asks me for say 10 dirhams and if i ask him why do you want it if he tells me i want to smoke a cigarette i will not give it to him because i know it is not good for him 
similarly when so many uh, asuras also uh, worship demigods and they ask for boons from uh, mahadev ho ya um, brahma ho ya various other demigods the boons they get but they misuse them which is not good but if they would have gone to krishna or vishnu they would not have got such boons fulfilled so what is deserved and beneficial that check is not applied by demigods they give only based on your karma on top of that one if i ask something for one demigod and as rao prabhu ji rightly mentioned i ask something for from one demigod he may give it to me and when that benefit is exhausted again i will go to that same or another demigod and ask for same thing or another something else so the chakra of desire and fulfillment and desire and fulfillment will continue what krishna or vishnu will do is along with that desire he will also give me the necessary knowledge by which i can stop desiring something like this and which is what happened with in the case of dhruva maharaj he sat there to want for a kingdom bigger than even brahma and uh, vishnu says this is actually very difficult meaning it is not good for you but still i will give it to you because you have desired but prior to fulfilling the desire dhruva maharaj had already reached a stage because vishnu chirudakshay vishnu touched his conchal onto the head of uh, dhruva maharaj he had already reached a stage where he says that i wanted a piece of glass and the whole diamond is in front of me so i am foolish in asking something like this from the greatest so the point is the right and wrong is not applied by demigods and the elimination of such desire is not applied by demigods that is the reason why shukadev goswami is saying that one should ask only from vishnu and not from demigods hari krishna so let's start from verse number 13 today uh, any questions uh, from any previous verse or we can start start okay hare krishna shaunak uvacha ityya bhi vyahrutam raja nishamya bhara tarshabha kimanyat prushtavan bhuyo vayasakim rushim kavim anybody can read the translation and purport swamak said the son of vyasadev shri sukhdev goswami was a highly learned sage and was able to describe things in a poetic manner what did maharaj parikshit again inquire from him after hearing all that he had said a pure devotee of the lord automatically develops all goodly qualities godly qualities and some of the prominent features of those qualities are as follows he is kind peaceful truthful equable faultless magnanimous mild clean non possessive a well wisher to all satisfied surrendered to krishna without hankering simple fixed self controlled a balanced eater sane mannerly prideless grave sympathetic friendly poetic expert and silent out of these 26 prominent features of a devotee as described by krishna das kaviraj in the chaitanya Char charitramrit charitramrit the qualification of being poetic is especially mentioned here in in relation to sukhdev goswami the presentation of shriman bhagavatam by his recitation is the highest poetic contribution he was a self realized learned sage in other words he was a poet amongst the sages amongst the sages right thank you prabhu so what has happened so far uh, parikshit maharaj has asked certain questions which he has answered now and he also mentions in one of the previous verses that i have ans uh, answered whatever you have asked for okay so automatically it is a kind of a logical end to the conversation so obviously now this dialogue is going on between shaunak rishi who is representing representing the other 88000 rishis and between him and suta goswami so when shukadev goswami answered this one obviously the it would have reached a logical end then suta goswami must have stopped over there so then shaunak rishi must have taken that as an opportunity to ask 
further questions to know more what Shukadev Goswami spoke to Maharaj Parikshit. Okay. Now, uh, all these 26 qualities which are mentioned, we can learn it from Chaitanya Charitamrita. But even in Bhagavad Gita, there are various places where the qualities of a devotee are mentioned. Does anyone remember two, three of them? <laughs> in two, three places. Okay, one place at least. Nein? So, the 12th chapter is where uh, yes, Sushil Prabhu, you want to say something? Okay. No. The twelfth chapter may from the thirteenth verse till the nineteenth verse. Okay, Krishna talks about twenty-six qualities of a devotee. So there also it is twenty-six. Then in the thirteenth chapter, he talks specifically about knowledge. Okay. And these are basically knowledge which actually is represented with the behavior of a person. So all of these he talks here are mentioned here, uh, which basically Krishna says that anything other than this is ignorance. And in the 16th chapter also, he talks about uh, certain qualities. I forgot the exact count of it, but uh, it starts with the first verse, in the first three verses. Abhayam Sattva Samshudir Jnana Yoga Gavastiti. So these are the various places where Krishna talks about the qualities of a devotee in Bhagavad Gita. And uh, there will you will not see kind of a difference between them. There might be one or two, three qualities additionally mentioned in different, different places. But overall, they point to all of these as godly qualities. So these qualities do exist in Krishna also because of which they have come into us. Uh, recently I came across one video uh, I have not I don't know about the authenticity of it but uh, you know uh, in material uh, world the literature uh, is kind of you know copyrighted meaning one is not allowed to copy it uh, without the permission of the author and that for to avoid this one, then one needs to prepare some acts and rules and regulations and all that. But our uh, scripture had something called as a built-in copyright. Okay, so it said that every odd or even syllable was of a particular metric or a particular tone, and because of which. And then every third, every fifth, every seventh syllable also had certain, uh, you know, reason and a particular aspect to it. And then in the second line also, the same thing gets repeated. Because of which, if somebody wants to copy it or modify it or, you know, um, change it, then it would be very difficult for him to do that. Now you imagine... Barring certain verses of Srimad Bhagavatam, which, is, which was purposefully spoken in that manner, majority or 99% of the verses of Srimad Bhagavatam are either a 32 syllable verse or a 48 syllable verse. Meaning, what you are seeing here now, okay, Eta Chrutva Shushruta Shushru Satam Vidwan, okay, this is eight, eight syllables, meaning A Tat. Shu, Shru, Tam, Vid, One. Okay. So, this 8 plus the second half of the first line, that 8 is 16. And 16 of the second line is 32. And then there are 12, 12, 12, 12 also. So, 48 uh, syllables. These kind of verses. And Bhagavad Gita, Bhagavad Gita has only these two type of verses. Now, you imagine somebody has to speak to you and in a poetic manner. So one has to be very, very a kind of, you know, big pandit in Sanskrit language. Firstly, he has to know the subject. Then he has to have a huge, you know, uh, ability on the language. 
uh, meaning the, the knowledge of, of the topic and the ability on the language. Then he has to have the poetic ability. He also has to have a thought process about the meters and the tones that are supposed to be used at different, different words. And finally, finally, they have to be within those eight or meaning the 32 or 48 syllable words. And on top of that one, because these verses, uh, they have a certain count, the scriptures, they have to align with the count also. So Bhagavatam has exactly 18,000 verses. Bhagavad Gita has exactly 700 verses. So somebody has to have such a meaning level of knowledge that he has to wrap up the whole thing, which includes the number of verses that a person may ask questions about in that specific count of verses. You can imagine the level of their Panditya. What uh, beyond imagination of our level it is. Hare Krishna. So verse number 14. Etat shushrusatam vidvan sutano arhasi bhashitum katha hari kathor katho dar kaha satam sihu sadasi dhruvam Hare Krishna. Translation. O learned Suta Goswami, Please continue to explain such topics to us because we are all eager to hear. Besides that, topics which result in the discussion of the Lord Hare should certainly be discussed in the assembly of devotees. Yeah. Purport. As we have, as we have already quoted above, above from the Bhakti Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu of Rupa Goswami, even mundane things, if dovetailed in the service of the Lord Sri Krishna, are accepted as transcendental. For example, the epics are the histories of Ramayana and Mahabharata, which are specially recommended for the less intelligent classes, women, sudras, and unworthy sons of the Ayar caste, are also accepted as a Vedic literature because they are compiled in connection with the activities of the Lord. Mahabharata is accepted as the fifth division of the Vedas after its first four divisions, namely Sama, Ejur, Rik, and Adharva. The less intelligent do not accept Mahabharata as part of the Vedas, but great sages and authorities accept it as the fifth division of the Vedas. Bhagavad Gita is also part of the Mahabharata and it is full of the Lord's instructions for the less intelligent class of men. Some less intelligent men say that Bhagavad Gita is not meant for householders, but such foolish men forget that Bhagavad Gita was explained to Arjuna, a Gruhastha family man, and spoken by the Lord in his role as a Gruhastha. So Bhagavad Gita, although containing the highly philosophy of the Vedic wisdom, is for the beginners in the transcendental science and Srimad Bhagavatam is for graduates and postgraduates in the transcendental science. Therefore, literatures like Mahabharata, the Puranas and similar other literatures, which are full of the pastimes of the Lord, are all transcendental literatures and they should be discussed with full confidence in the society of great devotees. The difficulty is that such literatures, when discussed by the professional men, appear to be mundane literature like studies or epics because there are so many historical facts and figures. It is said here, therefore, that such literature should be discussed in the assembly of devotees. Unless they are discussed by devotees, such literatures cannot be released by the higher class of men. So the conclusion is that the Lord is not impersonal in the ultimate issue. He is the supreme person and he has his different activities. He is the leader of all living entities and he descends at his will and by his personal energy to reclaim the fallen souls. Thus, he plays exactly like the social, political or religious leaders. Because such roles ultimately cultivate in the discussion of topics of the Lord, all such preliminary topics are also transcendental. That is the way of spiritualizing the civic activities of human society. Men have inclinations for studying history and many other mundane literatures, stories, fiction, dramas, magazines, newspapers, etc. So let them be dovetailed with the transcendental service of the Lord and all of them will turn to the topics released by all, by all devotees. The propaganda that the Lord is impersonal, that he has no activity and that he is a dumb stone without any name and form has encouraged, has encouraged people to become godless, faithless, demons and the more 
they deviate from the transcendental activities of the Lord, the more they become accustomed to mundane activities that only clear their path to hell instead of return them home back to Godhead. Srimad Bhagavatam begins from the history of the Pandavas with the necessary politics and social activities and at Srimad Bhagavatam is said to be the Paramahamsa Samhita or the Vedic literature meant for the topmost transcendentalist and it describes Param Jnanam, the highest transcendental knowledge. Pure devotees of the Lord are all Paramahamsas and they are like the swans who know the art of sucking milk out of a mixture of milk and water. Jai yeah. Srila you know, when you read Prabhupada's purport, no, that itself, it's so, so deep and so great it is. And he, uh, one of our devotees, uh, he did mention some time back that you take any verse of Prabhupada's purport, you will get maximum philosophy from the, his purport for that one verse alone. You do not read to read the whole book as such. Okay. And here also same thing, you know, the Lord, impersonal aspect, who are the lower class and why do they are, are the lower class, uh, meaning uh, what is it that they are interested, what is it that they should be interested in and uh, amazing. So now uh, uh, automatically a question can come up as to Ramayana and Mahabharata are meant, uh, recommended for the less intelligent people. Why do you think that is the case? What do you think is the reason behind that? If you read Ramayana, Mahabharat, you are considered as less intelligent. Is that a right way of looking at it? No, maybe it is uh, the person who is so much involved in the material activities. Okay, but then uh, why why it is meant for less intelligent men? Meaning, uh, I may have a book which is actually at a PhD level, but I will give that book if I give that book to a beginner, will will it be right? Uh, he, he, he may not be able to un understand that part. So the person who is totally involved into the material activities, huh. to start with, we need to give something which is easily digestible. Huh. Then and later it can... Very, very, very valid point. And why is it easily digestible? Because it relates to the your, your, uh, your directed, you, the way you are living. Oh, okay, okay. So just to put it in a different manner, what happens is uh, the Vedas, especially the four Vedas, they are in the form of principles, Sutra it is called as, which means that if I tell you that Patram Pushpam Phalam Toyam Yome Bhaktya Prayachati, okay, Krishna accepts a leaf, a fruit or a flower or water if you uh, give it to him with love and devotion. Now this becomes a principle. You may not easily understand why he accepts, how he accepts, all that. Right? And if I tell you, Dehi no asmin yatha dehe kaumaram yavanam jara, huh? a, 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 a living entity as it moves from one uh, stage of a body from boyhood to youth to old age, similarly, a atma leaves one body and goes into another. Now, this is a principle you may not know it or understand it immediately, the whole concept just based on the principle. So what happens? Then somebody has to go in detail to explain what is a Atma, what is boyhood, what is youth, what is body, what is uh, transmigration and all that. Then probably you can understand. But there could be certain people who may not understand even after that also. Now they need certain support uh, via the form of stories which are told to them and they can understand based on the stories. So if somebody says, you know, so and so person, in his previous life, he was so and so person. Because of XYZ things, he happened to become so and so person in this particular life. Now what happens because of this one? Then because his level of intelligence is a bit low, he cannot understand the concept at a principle level and only at a story level, then it becomes simple for him to understand the principle and the concepts. And that is where Ramayana and Mahabharat come into picture. So Lord Ram did not become great because Ramayana was written on him or because he descended on earth and took birth as Lord Ram that did not make him great. 
he was great before itself before he he became he before, he came on to earth and because of his greatness he took birth because of that birth he did perform various activities because he was great if somebody were to try would try to understand about lord ram without ramayan it will be very difficult for him that is where these leelas come into picture these leelas are more for our personal interaction with the lord only because we can it helps us understand the lord better we can relate to him mahabharat specifically was written uh, written and it was acted that way it it is mahabharat is like a kind of a drama which is this which was decided what should happen it was done specifically because dwapa yug was about to get over kali yug was going to get started and for the people to people in kali yug to understand vedic philosophy would be very difficult that is the reason mahabharat was enacted so that what is one supposed to do what is one not supposed to do how should one lead life can be learned from mahabharat so that's why it is called as people it is the it literature for less intelligent men that doesn't mean mahabharat is less intelligent so mahabharat has come down to the level of less intelligent people so that they can understand and there mahabharat itself will pull that less intelligent person to the highest possible level especially because bhagavad gita is there in that in even the principles that are explained in mahabharat are amazing principles even ramayana also and it is not unnecessarily that uh, lord krishna says janma karma ch me divyam evam yovati tatvatah if one can understand the lord via his stories then his life becomes sublime which is what is possible by reading about Mah ramayana and mahabharat and because these people then think that it is a kind of either a part of mythology or just a kind of history so those people who consider ramayana and mahabharata as mythology what they think is oh this is come out of some person's imagination and this is indoctrinated within the current youth also and we also learnt in similar manner right how many people even hindus so uh, regularly use the word mythology why because they do not understand the true meaning of the word mythology actually mythology is a insult okay so let's say if your grandson uses the uh, when your when your son writes about you and your grandson reads about it if your grandson says okay i am reading the mythology about my grandfather then does it make sense because mythology is coming from the word myth myth meaning false which is not true so meaning the personality of yourself which is being written by your son and read by your grandfather is now being treated as mythology it is completely incorrect so without even understanding the meaning of this word mythology people use it so naturally as if you know it is how it is supposed to be spoken that's why whenever possible i stress in uh, any forum or any class that do not use the word mythology this has been you know stuffed upon us by the britishers because they wanted us to get diverted from our roots from our dharma so to say that ramayana and mahabharata are mythology we are saying that lord ram lord krishna are myth they did not exist at all okay so one day one particular hindu was using the word and i asked him uh, do you believe in god he said yes do you pray to god on a daily basis he said yes so before uh, leaving for office he prays to god and he comes so i said which god so and so god okay then uh, 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 if you pray to this god aren't you a fool he asked me why because at one end you call him as a myth using the word mythology and the other end you are paying to him, pray, praying to him so how is it possible that something which is untrue something which is false you are praying to that so you are a bigger fool than an atheist also so it is because of this you know uh, 
inappropriate understanding of these words that people uh, misunderstand uh, the concept as well. For such kind of people, it is it is for their benefit, their upliftment that these uh, histories then benefit them. Even people who consider Ramayana and Mahabharata as just histories, even they are less intelligent because then they reduce Lord Ram and Lord Krishna to just a historical personality. So today, uh, to, uh, when we read uh, history about uh, Chanakya and Chandragupta and Shivaji and Detaji Bose and all that, they are historical personalities. They are not the Supreme Lord. So Rama and Mahabharat is not same as our historical textbook, a textbook of history. They uh, both are different. Just because it happened few thousand and few hundreds of thousands of years doesn't mean the historical book can be equated with a scripture. So history is different, scripture is different, Vedic literature is different. And this is what Prabhupada is highlighting here. Even people consider that uh, some uh, people have a misunderstanding that uh, one should not keep Bhagavad Gita at home. Because Bhagavad Gita, if you keep it at home, it will be broken in the house. So, uh, such kind of thought process people have. One person who came to my house, one day he saw me, uh, saw a big uh, photo. I have this photo of uh, you know, Parthasarthi, wherein uh, Arjun and Lord Krishna are there on the chariot. And he said, what are you going to do at home? You will get to the house. So I said, that you are at home, you will not do that. Then tumari ghar pe jagda hota hai, to hai to wala, how does it happen then? So this is not the cause of jagda. In fact, this is the cause of peace. So people have this kind of notion. So Bhagavad Gita is actually meant for uplifting us from our current material situation to take us to the highest level of spirituality. But it is still at a basic level. Why? Because of one primary reason. Bhagavad Gita describes what a bhakti, bhakta devotee is supposed to do. He describes himself. Krishna describes himself. Krishna describes what we are supposed to do. But Krishna does not describe the process in detail. The process of bhakti is detailed in Bhagavatam. So when I know, okay, fine, Krishna is the supreme. I am supposed to do the devotion to him. But how do I do the devotion? How do I know what all previous devotees did in order to reach Krishna? That is explained in Srimad Bhagavatam. So that's why Bhagavad Gita is considered to be basic philosophy, whereas Srimad Bhagavatam is considered a graduate material, graduation material, and Chaitanya Charita Amrutu is considered to be postgraduate material. The problem uh, which Prabhupada writes about is when we hear this matter, the literature from professional people, they may not necessarily apply uh, the truth when they speak. Now, to understand this one, let's take an example uh, or, or the example of a sadhu. So sadhus, sages, they are generally... Uh, do not have any kind of you know attraction to material stuff. So uh, getting appreciated by people or getting money from people and all that, that is not their objective. So because they do not have any material objective, they are not worried about speaking the truth. But when a professional person has some material objective, then he focuses on what is palatable to the people, what they would like to hear, accordingly he speaks. So that's why there is a good chance he may not be speak the truth. That is where the message gets diluted. It can go wrong as well completely. And that's where when such people talk about Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita, Mahabharata, Ramayana, the uh, a message can be reduced down to just historical facts and figures. And that is where Krishna Prabhupada talks about it on a regular basis. You may have seen this point coming in few other verses also. Do not hear Bhagavatam from professional people. You should hear it only 
in via devotees and then the discussion also happens within devotees because then there is a, a kind of you know um, inclination to appreciate the matter you will understand it better because you are hearing from a devotee and you are discussing among a devotee Hare Krishna so I think let's move on and another point about Bhagavatam and even Bhagavad Gita also so in Bhagavad Gita except for verse number 31 to 37 uh, of the second chapter which was an answer to uh, second and third question of Arjun. Bhagavad Gita does not talk about any material benefit at all. Right? And Bhagavatam does not talk about any material benefit from beginning till end. That is why Bhagavad Gita and Bhagavatam are Amala Purana. Meaning, not Puran, Bhagavad Gita is not Puran, but Amala, basically there is no material dirt in it, which means anything that is an impurity which can cause you to take one more birth, any such thing is absent from Bhagavad Gita and Bhagavatam. That's why it is called as Amala. Hare Krishna. So let's move on. Let's read verse number 15. Savai Bhagavato Raja Pandaveyo Maharathaha Bala Krida Nakai Kridan Krishna Kridam Yadade Translation uh, Translation Translation by Srila Prabhupada yeah, Maharaj Parikshat, the grandson of the Pandavas, was from his very childhood a great devotee of the Lord. Even while playing with lords, he used to worship Lord Krishna by imitating the worship of the family deity. Purport, purport by Srila Prabhupada, Jai Srila Prabhupada. In the Bhagavad Gita 6.41, it is stated that even a person who has falled in the proper, proper discharge of yoga practice is given a chance to take birth in the house of devout brahmanas or in the house of rich men like Kshatriya kings or rich merchants. But Maharaj Parikshat was more than that because he had been a great devotee of the Lord since his previous birth and as such he took birth, took his birth in an imperial family of the Kurus, 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 Kurus and especially that of the Pandavas. So from the very beginning of his childhood he had the chance to know in, intimately the devotional service of the Lord Krishna in his own family. The Pandavas, all being devotees of the Lord, certainly uh, uh, venerated family deities in the royal palace for worship. Children who appear in such families fortunately generally imitate such worship of the deities, even in the way of childhood play. By the grace of Lord Sri Krishna, he had the chance of being born in a Vaishnava family and in our childhood uh, in our childhood we imitated the worship of Lord Krishna by imitating our father. Our father encouraged us in all respects to observe all functions such as the Ratha Yatra and Dola Yatra ceremonies and he used to spend money liberally for distributing prasadas, prasad to us children and our friends. Our spiritual master who also took his birth in a Vaishnava family, got all inspirations from his great Vaishnavas, Vaishnava father. Thakur Bhakti Vinoda, that uh, Vaishnava father, Thakur Bhakti Vinoda. That is the way of all lucky Vaishnava families. A celebrated, a celebrated Mira Bhai was a staunch devotee of Lord Krishna as the greater litter of the Gordana Hills. The life history of many such devotees in such is such the same because there is always symmetry between the early lives of all great devotees of the Lord. According to Jiva Goswami, Maharaj Parikshit must have heard about the childhood pastimes of Lord Krishna at Vrindavan. For he used to imitate the pastimes with his young playmates. According to Siddhartha, Sridhara 
Sridhar Swami, Sridhar Swami Maharaj Parikshit used to imitate the worship of the family deity by elderly members. Srila Vishwantha Vishwantha Chakravarti also confirmed the viewpoint of Jiva Goswami. So, accepting either of them, Maharaj Parikshit was naturally inclined to Lord Krishna for his very childhood, from his very childhood. He might have imitated either of the above mentioned activities and all of them established his great devotion from his very childhood. A symptom of a Mahabhagavata a childhood, a symptom of a Mahabhagavata. Such Mahabhagavatas are called Nitya Siddhas or soul liberated from birth. But there are also others who may not be liberated from birth but who develop a tendency to devotional service by association. And they are called Sid Sadhana, Sadhana Siddhas. There is no difference between the two in the ultimate issue and so the conclusion is that everyone can become a sadhana siddha, a devotee of the Lord, simply by association with the pure devotees. The concrete example in our great spiritual master, Sri Narada Muni. In his previous life, he was simply a boy of maid servant. But through association with great devotees, he became a devotee of the Lord of his own standard, unique in the history of devotional service. Jai, Jai Shila Prabhupada. Hare Krishna. Krishna. Thank you so much, Prabhu. So one of the key points that comes out is if you want to become a devotee, you have to associate with devotees. Okay. So if you do that from uh, the beginning of your life, uh, basically if you are born into a devotee family, then your journey of becoming or continuous uh, continuation of the journey of your devotional life happens from the moment you take birth or even while you are in the womb of your mother. But if that doesn't happen at that point, if one um, associates with people a little later in the life, still it is nothing that is lost there. It's just that you have started 20-30 years later. So, uh, which means Compared to the previous life, you are starting 20, 30, 40 years before. Okay. So one of my, uh, in Mumbai local trains, uh, we have uh, a train that comes from one station and goes to church gate. So it was, because the train used to be packed fully, my uncle used to uh, go back one station and he used to get into the train at that station. So then one day he told us that, you know, by getting into the train one station before he gets a feeling that he is the first one to get in at the regular station where he stays so similarly we we may not be so fortunate that we got the opportunity to become a true proper devotee of the lord when we were in the womb of our mother fine but this is not a kind of something which can handicap us we may have become, after we became 20, 30, 40 years of age, we have started walking on the path of devotional service. It That itself means that compared to our next life, we are starting 20, 30 years before. So which means it is better that when we reach to the womb of the next mother, we, were, we would already become devotees and our devotional paths, path will be even far more simpler than what it is today. Krishna will obviously help us. Now, Prabhupada is a very modest person because of which he did not talk about himself much. He talked about only certain things. Okay, He also did not talk about uh, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur in greater detail. Now, uh, this uh, the Thakur mentioned here, Bhakti Vinod Thakur, he is the father of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, who is the spiritual master of Srila Prabhupada. Now, he, uh, Bhakti Vinod Thakur, had six children, something like that. And uh, one day, he prayed to Krishna, stating that, I do not find 
any of my six children have the necessary qualities by which they can, you know, preach your glories regularly. Meaning they will not be in a position to devote themselves fully to the to your service. So he prayed and he said that I give me one child who can remain Naishthiki Brahmachari, Ajanma Brahmachari. From the beginning till the end, he will not indulge in marriage, sex, in anything. He will focus fully and dedicate his whole life only to your service. He had prayed. Accordingly, he got a child in his family. He was such a great soul that when he was three days old, he had just born, just three days old, Jagannath Rathayatra was going uh, from that place. So the cart of Lord Jagannath, it stopped right in front of his house. And it did not move at all. People tried many, many things. Many, many horses, elephants, ropes and all were used to pull that Lord, to pull the cart. But the cart did not move. And it remained in that place for three days, four days. Then people were wondering as to why this is happening. Because this was the same cart on the same road that we have moved so many for so many years. And even this year also we moved it in the same manner. Why is it not moving ahead? Definitely Lord Jagannath wants us to do something. And then they inquired and then they realized that this child is born and he is a divine child. They, they came to know about Lord Thakur Bhakti Vinod also from there. And then they brought that child in front of Lord Jagannath and after that the cart moved, cart moved ahead. So this being uh, Prabhupada, being a modest person, he is not writing about all of this. This is written in a few other scriptures where Thakur Bhakti Siddhanta has been, uh, you know, his charitra has been mentioned. Now, such a person was a devotee, not just from the beginning of his life, but he was sent by Krishna to perform these activities. So we can understand to reach that level, to what level of devotion we need for Krishna, so that we can also get one day some service like this one for Krishna. Hare Krishna. So the point uh, Prabhupada is writing all of this one is to tell us that if you are a devotee from childhood, your path towards Krishna is far simpler. If not, although it is not a drawback, but there is an extra effort that will be required from our side to reach to that stage. Hare Krishna. Any questions so far or can I continue? No? Okay, let's move on. Vaya Sakishcha Bhagavan Vasudeva Parayanaha Urugaya Guno Daraha Satam Surhi Samagame Translation and purport. Sukhdev Goswami, the son of Vyasadeva, was also full of transcendental knowledge and was a great devotee of the Lord Krishna, son of Vasudeva. So there must have been discussion of Lord Krishna, who is glorified by great philosophers and in the company of great devotees. The word satam, satam. Uh, satam, is, satam is very important in this word. Satam means the pure devotee who have no other desire than to serve the Lord. Only in the association of such devotees are the transcendental glories of Lord Krishna properly discussed. It is said by the Lord that his topics are all full of spiritual significance and once one properly hears about him in the association of the satam certainly one senses the great potency and so automatically attains to the devotional stage of the life as already discussed maharaj parikshit was a great devotee of the lord from his very from his very birth and so was sukhdev goswami both of them were on the same level although it appeared that maharaj parikshit was a great king accustomed to royal facilities, whereas Sukhdev Goswami was a typical renouncer of the world, so, so much so that he did not even put a cloth, cloth on his body. Superficially, Maharaj Parikshit 
and Sukhdev Goswami might seem to be opposites, but basically they were both unalloyed, pure devotees of the Lord. When such devotees are assembled together, there can be no topics, save discussions of the glories of the Lord or Bhakti Yoga. In the Bhagavad Gita also, when there were talks between the Lord and his devotee Arjun, there could not be any topic other than the Bhakti Yoga. However, the mundane scholars may speculate on it in the other ways. The use of the word sh sh oh. after Vatya Sak. Vaya Saki. That means Vaya Saki. Suggest, according to Srila Deep Goswami, that both Sukhdev Goswami and Maharaj Parikshit were of the same category, settled long before, although one was playing the part of the master and other was other the disciple. Since Lord Krishna is the center of the topics, the word Vasudev Parayan or devotee of Vasudev suggests devotee of Lord Krishna, the common aim. Although there were many others who assembled at the place where Pari Maharaj Parikshit was fasting, the natural conclusion is that there was no topic other than the glorification of Lord Krishna because the principal speaker was Sukhdev Goswami and the chief audience was Maharaj Parikshit. So Srimad Bhagavatam, as it was spoken and heard by the two principal devotees of the Lord, is only for the glorification of Supreme Lord, the personality of the Godhead, Shri Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. So we may have spoken this point before that when uh, Bhagavatam was being spoken, by Shukadev Goswami to Maharaj Parikshit, the speech the started for continuous seven days and seven nights and not a single break even for bodily duties was taken by anybody, let alone the speaker or the main hearer Maharaj Parikshit, even others also did not get up even for a single moment. And today, what we have? Today we have breaks after breaks. You know, if there is a day-long training that happens in the company, if we get break after every hour, 10-minute break, 15-minute break and all that. Right? Now we can imagine the concentration level of the people that time was beyond imagination. It was so huge. That concentration could not be disturbed by hunger, by thirst, by sleep, by anything, by any physical discomfort. Such is the greatness of those people at that time. You imagine when we do Bhishma Panchak, for five days we do not eat food. It becomes so terrible, so difficult to live without food. Okay, so let alone concentrating on Krishna, that comes a little later, but to be able to negate the thirst and hunger of the body, it becomes very difficult. Here, you need, uh, Maharaj Parikshit was not just tolerating it. He did not even realize that he is hungry or thirsty because the words spoken by Shukadev Goswami were of more interest to him. On top of that one, uh, he was so wrapped in attention that immediately after Shukadev Goswami used to finish some topic, he used to ask another question. And that, uh, you know, uh, series went on. So sometimes I may be physically present, but mentally I may not be. But that was not the case. He was physically present, completely unaware of his bodily necessities focusing with such an attention and great detail where level questions were also being asked. That is the quality of a dialogue that should happen and which can, which can only happen when you have pure devotional uh, service towards Krishna. So when Arjun uh, was hearing Bhagavad Gita, you know, especially uh, you may have, uh, you may remember, that even in 7.29 and 7.30, Krishna says, Sadhi Bhuta de Devam Maam Sadhi Adnyam Chaye Vidhu Prayana Kale Picha Maam Pe Vidur Yukta Chetasa. Okay, so this was the moment he spoke, immediately Arjun asked a question in 8.1 and 8.2. What are these? What are you talking about? 
प्लीज एक्सप्लेन टू मी सो ही डिंट से यार ठीक है यार दिस डजेंट सीम टू बी रेलेवेंट इग्नोर हिम या अरे यार मेरा ध्यान नहीं था कैन यू रिपीट प्लीज कैन यू रिपीट ये ऐसा नहीं है इमीडिएटली so that the greatness in terms of attention was also there the topic was so much of interest the speaker is absolutely amazing the listener is also amazing all these qualities then they make up a great dialogue between each other and uh, that dialogue is only possible when both are pure devotees if one of them has some kind of you know material tinge over there some kind of material selfishness then that purity will never be there hari krishna now this is one very very important verse uh, it is among the 500 favorite verses of prabhupad this particular verse comes in so we will learn this one now आयुर्हरति वैपुंसा उद्यनास्त चयनसौ ते यो नीत उत्तम श्लोक वार्तया ट्रांसलेशन बोथ बै रईजिंग एंड बै सेटिंग द सन डिक्रीजेस द ड्यूरेशन ऑफ लाइफ ऑफ एवरी वन एक्सेप्ट वन हू युटिलाइज द टाइम ऑफ Time by discussing topics of all good personal uh, topics of the all good personality of Godhead. Purport: This verse indirectly confirms the greater importance of utilizing the human form of life to realize our lost relationship with the Supreme Lord by acceleration of devotional service. Time and tide wait for no man, so the time indicated by the sunrise and the sunset will be uselessly wasted if such time is not properly utilized for realizing identification of spiritual values. even a fraction of the duration of life wasted cannot be compensated by any amount of gold human life is simply awarded by living entity jiva so that he can realize his spiritual identity and his permanent source of happiness a living being especially the human being is seeking happiness because happiness is the natural situation of the natural situation of the living entity but he is vainly seeking happiness in the material atmosphere a living being is con uh, conscious uh, constitutionally a spiritual spark of the complete all and his happiness can be perfectly perceived in spiritual activities the lord is the complete spirit whole and his name form quality past times into rage and personality are all identical with him once a person comes into contact with any of the above mentioned energies of the lord through the proper channel of devotional service the door to perfection is immediately opened in the bhagavad gita 2.40 the lord has explained the such contact in the following words endeavors in devotional service are never baffled nor is their failure a slight beginning of such activities is sufficient even to deliver a person from the great ocean of material fears as a highly potent drug injected intra intravenous intravenously intravenously act at once on the whole body the transcendental topics of the lord injected through the ear where the pure devotee of the lord can act very efficiently oral realization of the transcendental messages implies total realization just as a uh, fructification of one part of the one part of tree implies fructification of all other parts this realization for a moment in the association of pure devotees like sukadeva goswami prepares one's complete life for eternity and thus the sun fails to rob the pure devotee of his duration of life in uh, in in as much as he is constantly busy in the devotional service of the lord purifying his existence death is a symptom of the material infection of the eternal living being only due to material infection is the eternal living entity subjected to the law of birth death old age and disease the materialistic way of payas activities like charity is recommended in the smriti shastras as quoted by srila vishwanath chakravarti thakura money given in charity to a suitable person is guaranteed bank balance in the next life such a charity is recommended to be given to a brahmana if the money is given in a charity to a non brahmana without brahmanical qualification the money is returned in the next life in the same proportion if it is given in charity to a off educated brahmana even then the money is returned double 
if the money is given in charity to a learned and fully qualified brahmana the money is returned a hundred and thousand times and if the money is given to the veda paraga one who has factually realized the path of the vedas it is returned by unlimited multiplication the ultimate end of vedic knowledge is realization of the personality of godhead lord krishna as stated in the bhagavad gita vedascha vedascha sarvair aham eva vedah there is there is a guarantee of money is being returned if given in charity regardless of the proportion similarly a movement passed in the association of a pure devotee by hearing and chanting the transcendental messages of the lord is a perfect guarantee for eternal life for returning home back to godhead madhama gatva punar janma na vidyate in other words a devotee of the lord is guaranteed eternal life a devotee's old age or disease in the present life is but an impetus to such guaranteed eternal life jai shri la prabhu jai shri la prabhu so there is a kind of a understanding that can wrongly developed by reading this verse saying that if a person is a devotee of lord krishna his life or his duration of life increases or it doesn't decrease in the same proportion as it decreases for a normal material being but that is not the actual import of this verse the duration of the life does not increase what shukadev goswami or shauna krishi especially is talking about here is for a person the utilization of life happens in a far better manner than if one were to utilize it for a material life which means all the investment that you do you get back in the next life so the reason why prabhupad is mentioning all of this about the charity is to give an example with respect to money so similarly when you invest your life you the duration of your life in certain certain activities like devotional service of the lord you get back that same duration and if you do it in to the best of the person like way the paraga then you get back in a unlimited multiplication and then he is saying that uh, a moment that you passed in the association of a pure devotee the that moment comes back to you as a unlimited multiplication of your investment in terms of your eternal life so this is how we need to understand this verse okay it is not that a clock can uh, go for 24 hours and for a normal life and it will go for 23 hours for a devotee or one hour for the devotee it is about the returns above of your investment you invest your life you get back eternal life you invest 10 moments you get back unlimited multiplication if it is for the devotee via the devotee so to to explain to this one the point that prabhupad is mentioning is the complete process about why this is important to do now we if we perform activities at the level of our material body then it also clearly uh, explains that we are unable to think beyond the material body we are only thinking at the uh, body the bodily happiness and the relationships of the body or the designations of the body but if one crosses that and thinks at the level of the soul which is who we actually are then we will be able to differentiate the bodily designations and the designations of, of the soul or the characteristics of the soul if we are able to do that then we will also understand that the happiness at the level of the soul is different from the happiness at the level of the body the happiness at the level of the body is good bank balance good wife good children good uh, car bungalow and all that that which is going to become zero at the time of our death but happiness at the uh, level of the soul is eternal happiness which is which comes via the devotional service to the lord so once we understand what is the right happiness and what is the wrong happiness then we can take a decision of the investment then we will know where to invest what to invest how to invest when to invest and when we take that decision then it becomes simple for getting the returns also that is what this particular verse in terms of um, uh, uh, at a principal level it is what it is explaining so it it 
it it is very important to understand whenever we are reading Prabhupada's purport, it is important to understand what is the key point that Prabhupada is trying to explain, which links with the verse. Once we are able to understand that, then the purport is very beautiful, simple to understand. Hare Krishna. Any question? Any questions? Nay? Okay. So let's read verse number 18. Taravah kim na jivanti bhastrah kim na shvasantyuta na khadanti na mehanti kim grame pashavo pare. Translation. Just take a minute. I'm just taking kitna purport. Purports are quite big now. We may not get full time, but iska pad lete hai. Translation, anybody reading? Who's reading? I'll read Prabhuji. Yeah, please. Purport, purport by Srila Prabhupada. Uh, sorry, uh, yeah. translation, translation by Srila Prabhupada. Yeah. Jai Srila Prabhupada. Do the trees not leave? Do the billows of the blacksmith not breathe? All around us, do beats uh, do bees not eat and discharge seem purport purport by shila prabhupada jai shila prabhupada the materialistic men of the modern age will argue that life or part of it is never meant for discussion of theosophical or theological arguments life is meant for the maximum duration of existence for eating drinking sexual intercourse making merry and enjoying life the modern man wants to live forever by the advancement of material sciences and there are many foolish theories for prolonging life to the maximum duration. But the Srimad Bhagavatam affirms that life is not meant for so-called economic development or advancement of materialistic science for the hedonistic philosophy of eating, mating, drinking and merrymaking. Life is solely meant for tapasya, for purifying existence, so that one may enter into eternal life just after the end of human form of life. The materialistic want to prolong life as much as possible because they have no information of the next life. They want to get the maximum comforts in this present life because they think conclusively that there is no life after death. The ignorance about the eternity of the living being and the changes and the change of covering in the material world has played havoc in the structure of modern human society. Consequently, there are many problems multiplied by various plans of modernized man. The plans of solving the problem of society have only aggravated the troubles. Even if it is possible to prolong life more than 100 years, advancement of human civilization does not necessarily follow. The Bhagavatam says that certain trees live for hundreds and thousands of years. At Vrindavan, there is a tamarind tree. The place is known as Imlita, Imlithal, which is said to have existed since the time of Lord Krishna. In the Calcutta Botanical Garden, there is a banyan tree said to be older than 500 years. And there are many such trees all over the world. Swami Shankaracharya lived only 32 years and Lord Chaitanya lived 48 years. Does this mean, does it mean that the prolonged lives of the above mentioned trees are more important than Shankara or Chaitanya? Prolonged life without spiritual value is not very important. One may doubt that trees have life because they do not breathe. But modern scientists like Bose has, have already proved that there is life in plants. So breathing is no sign of actual life. The Bhagavatam says that the bill, billows of the blacksmith breathes, uh, breaths very sound, uh, very soundly. But 
that does not mean that the bellows has life. The materialistic will argue that life in the tree and life in the man cannot be compared because the trees cannot enjoy life by eating palatable dishes or by enjoying sexual intercourse. In reply to this, the Bhagavatam asks every other animal like the dogs and hogs living in the same village with human beings do not eat and enjoy sexual life. The specific utterance of Srimad Bhagavatam in the regard to other animals means that person who are simply engaged in planning a better type of animal life consisting of eating, breathing and mating are also animals in the shape of human beings. A society of such polished animals cannot benefit suffering humanity. From for an animal can easily harm another animal but rarely do good. Jai Srila Prabhupada. Hare Krishna. See the beauty of Prabhupada's purport. It's, it's just beyond you know a, a regular person's ability to write such thing. So one is he is saying that uh, he is comparing the life of a tree, the duration of a life of a tree uh, with a human being. Yeah? So what does it mean? It's basically that living for a long life does not necessarily mean it is good for your spiritual life. So people here try to uh, compare the uh, mortality rate the uh, ex a life expectancy and they say that previously people used to die at 50 60 average now they are dying at 70 80 so scientists have been able to uh, uh, increase the life expectancy expectancy by around 10 20 years now is that good if life expectancy were to be good then why are euth euthanasia kind of stuff created to give death to people who want death yeah. That means life necessarily may not, long life may not necessarily be good. If that is used for a good purpose, then we can say it is good. Now, because um, the people may not necessarily understand what is good, what is right, what is wrong, they would consider the right as wrong and wrong as right, which is what the quality of mode of ignorance is. Because of which they will always think, if I get good life, long life, then I will, uh, 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 meaning, you know, uh, involve in uh, eating, mating and drinking and merrymaking kind of activities, which is what they consider as good because of which they want longer life. Now, what this verse teaches us is long life is there with the trees also. And even if men want it, human beings want it, they may get it also. But that long life of a tree is not necessarily benefiting itself spiritually. So similarly, long life of a human being may not benefit itself spiritually. It has to be used for spiritual purpose. Then only long life can be useful. Then a the question can come up that human body is meant for merrymaking. Yeah? Enjoy your senses. So then the question comes up is the senses are there with other animals also. So they are also enjoying, a human being also enjoys, then what is the difference? If enjoyment of eating, defending, sleeping, mating is the only thing that I am supposed to do with the body, then what is the difference between my body or me and an animal? Because the animal also does the same thing. And that is one of the very basic stuff. If you remember, we used to study in the previous, uh, the first class before started Bhagavad Gita. So that's when uh, Prabhupada compares these long duration trees of the Calcutta Botanical Garden with people like Chaitanya Mahaprabhu or Shankaracharya who lived for only 30-40 years. And they're saying, is this life better or that long life is better? Which is, we understand what is obvious, right? Then, uh, then he, he says that the breathing of somebody is not necessarily a sign of actual life. So which means if the bellows of a blacksmith also pull the air inwards after going up and push the air outwards when they go down. Yeah, so you must have seen that, right? So uh, what a blacksmith does, he uh, takes these metals and he welds them together, okay, by, you know, 
you know making them kind of you know uh, together uh, so one when the iron two iron metal pieces are hot he will hammer them together in such a manner that they will become a uniform one single object but that is only possible when it is hot now he will light the fire he will have coal in that and he will keep all those metal objects in that and he will use the bellow to blow air onto it and air will increase the fire more and more and more and it will keep the coal hot because of which the metals will start melting so what he is saying is the bellows also blow the air by going up and down continuously inhaling and exhaling is happening so the if breathing is a sign of life even the bellows have life but that is not what actually life is life is not just breathing or having a body or having a longer duration but being able to be put into the proper use which is the spiritual life then he talks about dogs and hogs which i will not cover in this verse because the next verse which is also a very very famous verse and part of the 500 verses of shrimad bhagavatam we will look at that so let's move on the purport here is a bit long so it would be good if somebody can read it a bit fast we have only 5 6 minutes left now so verse number 19 shv shvavit varah उष्ट्र उष्ट्रखरै संस्तुतः पुरुषः पशुः नयत कर्णापथो पेतो जातु नाम गदाग्रजः मेन हु आर लाइक डॉग्स हॉक्स कैमल्स एंड एसेस प्रेज दोस मेन हु नेवर लिसन टू द ट्रांसेंडेंटल पास्ट टाइम्स ऑफ लॉर्ड श्री कृष्ण द डिलीवरर फ्रॉम इविल्स the general mass of people unless they are trained systematically for a higher standard of life in spiritual values are no better than animals and in and in this verse they have particularly been put on the level of dogs hogs camels and asses modern university education practically prepares one to acquire a dogish mentality with which he to ex with which to accept the service of the great master after finishing his so called education the so the so called educated persons move like dogs from door to door with applications for some service and mostly they are driven away in form of no vacancy as dogs are negligible animals and serve the master faithfully for bits of bread a man serves a master faithfully without sufficient rewards person who have no discrimination in the matter of food stuff and who eat all sorts of rubbish are compared to hawks hawks are very much attached attached to the to eating stools so stool is a kind of food stuff for a particular type of animal and even stones are eatable for a particular type of animal or bird but the human being is not meant for eating everything and anything he is meant to eat grains vegetables fruits milk sugar etc animal food is not meant for the human being for chewing solid food the human being being or has a particular type of teeth meant for cutting fruits and vegetables the human being is endowed with two canine teeth teeth as a concession for persons who will eat animal food at any cost it is knows it it is knows to everyone that one man's food is another man's poison human beings are expected to accept the remnants of food offered to lord krishna and the lord accepts food stuff from the category of leaves flowers fruits etc as per bhagavad gita 9.26 as prescribed in the vedic scriptures no animal food is offered to the lord therefore a human being is meant to eat a particular type of food he should not imitate the animals to derive so called vitamin values therefore a person who has no discrimination in regard to eating is compared to a hawk the camel is a kind of animal that takes pleasure in eating thorns a person who wants to enjoy a family life or the worldly life of so called enjoyment is compared to the camel materialistic life is full of thorns and so one should live only by the prescribed method of vedic vedic regulations just to make the best use of by bad bargain life in the material world is maintained by sucking one's own blood the central point of attraction for material enjoyment is sex life 
to enjoy sex life is to suck one's own blood and there is not much more to be explained in this connection. The camel also sucks its own blood while chewing thorny twigs. The thorns are the, the thorns the thorns the camel eats cut the tongue of the camel and so the blood begins to flow within the camel's mouth. The thorns mixed with the flesh, fresh blood create a taste for the foolish camel and so he enjoys a thorn-eating business with false pleasure. Similarly, the great with, with similarly the great business magnates, industrialists who work very hard to earn money by different ways and questionable means eat the thorny results of their actions mixed with their own blood. Therefore, the Bhagavatam has situated these diseased fellows up uh, along with the camels. The ass is the animal who is celebrated as the greatest fool even amongst the animals. The ass works very hard and carries burdens of the maximum weight without making profit for itself. The ass is generally engaged for, by the washerman whose social position is not very respectable. And a special qualification for the of the ass is that it is very much accustomed to being kicked by the opposite sex. When the ass backs for sexual intercourse, he is kicked by the fair sex. Yet he still follows the female for such sexual pleasure. A hand-packed man is compared, therefore, to the ass. The general mass of people work very hard, especially in the age of Kali. In this age, the human being is actually engaged in the work of an ass, with carrying heavy burdens and driving thela and rickshaws. Thela and rickshaws. The so-called advancement of human civilization has engaged in a human being in the work of an ass. The laborers in the great factories and workshops are also engaged in such burdensome work. And after working hard during the day, the poor laborer has to be again kicked by the fair sex, not only for the sex enjoyment, but also for so many household affairs. So, Shriman Bhagavatam, Bhagavatam's categorization of the common man without any spiritual alignment into the society of dogs, hawks, camels and asses is not at all an exaggeration. The leaders of such ignorant masses of people may feel very proud of being adored by such a number of by such a number of dogs and hawks, but that is not very flattering. The Bhagavatam openly declares that although a person may be a great leader of such dogs and hawks disguised as men, if he has no taste for being enlightened in the science of Krishna, such a leader is not an animal and nothing is also an animal and nothing more. He also be he may be designated as a powerful, strong animal or a big animal, but in the estimation of Srimad Bhagavatam, he is never given a place in the category of man or account of his aesthetic, aesthetic temperament. Or in other words, such godless leaders of dogs and hog-like men are bigger animals with the qualities of animals in greater proportion. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. You can imagine if Prabhupada's purport were not there, would we be able to understand this verse? Why is Bhagavatam comparing uh, human beings with dogs, hogs, camels and asses? So it is because of his purport that we are able to uh, draw some similarity of the characteristics of men between uh, and compare that with the various, the four animals mentioned. So the first thing is a dog. So dog, what he does is even if uh, he becomes a loyal servant to his master, whatever he gets to it, he is happy and he continues to serve his master. Okay. And he, if it's a street level dog, then he will go from door to door. He may get kicked. He may get some food. People will throw stones at him or whatever it is. But because he is getting food, he remains loyal to them. Okay. The hogs have a tendency to eat anything and everything. They do not have the power of discrimination of what to eat, what not to eat. So we also do the same thing, right? People who eat vegetarian food stuff also may want to eat anything, everything. Uh, meaning just because it is vegetarian food doesn't mean it is the best kind of food. The best kind of food is what we offer to Krishna and we eat prasad. So the 
material characteristics of the food is not used to distinguish between the best and the worst kind of food. It is the spiritual characteristics that the prasad is the best food to be eaten. And then when we are offering prasad, we distinguish between what is offerable and what is not offerable. Krishna has never mentioned and he never accepts food which is made from animals like non-vegetarian food. He does not accept, we do not offer, hence we do not eat that. So we, we eat only what is offered to Krishna. A, a, a vegetarian person is still better than a non-vegetarian eater because at least he is not killing animals for that. Right. So a non-vegetarian eater, a person does eat any and every nonsense. So he, uh, there are people who eat even pigs also. So you can imagine, the, see, look at the thought here. So you eat something and your stools are being eaten by an uh, animal. Now that stool, after that animal eats, it tries to extract something out of it, which nourishes his body and he grows. Okay, and the waste of that is he what he, uh, uh, meaning, you know, uh, uh, basically he leaves out, he gives it out. So your waste of your body, which goes and acts as nutrition for another body is now coming back into your body. That is what a non-vegetarian is eating, especially when he is eating an animal like hog. Okay, so forget this point alone, but the point is, the animal, even while uh, speaking about this one, I feel like puking, but uh, uh, animal does not distinguish between what they are supposed to eat. Yeah, A chicken, people eat chicken, right? Uh, many of these chicken, they are fed uh, various things. Some chicken may be lucky to get grains, but some chicken do eat small insects also like cockroaches and ants and all that stuff. So that food is now coming into your body. Okay, definitely it is not acceptable even from a normal standard also, let alone offering to Krishna. So these hogs are those which eat anything and everything and their tendency, which is similar to human tendency to eat any nonsense, is compared here. Okay, the camel, this is a very uh, beautiful example. So camels, because they have a very, very thick tongue, Okay, the that thickness of the tongue has reduced the sensitivity of that. Because of which what happens when they eat uh, leaves of various trees and those trees have thorns on them, when the uh, camel goes and tries to bite the leaves, the thorns of the tree, they prick the tongue of the camel. Because of which the blood starts coming out of the tongue. Now the camel, because of this thickness of the tongue, the sensitivity is low. It doesn't, doesn't immediately realize that his tongue is getting cut. And because of the tongue getting cut, the blood comes out of the tongue and the blood mixes within the leaves, what are being chewed. And that blood, then because it is tasty according to the camel, it increases the taste of the leaves. So he thinks that the leaves that he is eating are tasty. He doesn't realize that the blood is making uh, or is increasing that taste which he is feeling. And he then wants to eat more leaves because of the taste of that leaves or the mixed with the blood. And when he eats it more, the more thorns prick the tongue, the more blood comes out and more tasty it becomes and the more he wants to eat it. So this is compared with a human being. So when a human being involves in a sexual intercourse, the semen that comes up is the seventh level of purification of blood. Okay, so uh, I don't know the exact ratio here, but I had heard one devotee mentioning that many, many drops of blood when it undergoes huge amount of purification, meaning the seventh level of purification, then one drop of semen is formed. So if a person having sexual intercourse has, you know, emitted out say 10 drops of blood, then practically it means that he has wasted around 100, bloods, 100 drops of blood. And that is what the human being tries to enjoy out of the that experience. 
which means that you are wasting your blood and you are still enjoying out of it. That is the comparison between human being and a camel. And the ass, we understand that the ass is a foolish animal. He uh, is, you know, dumped upon huge amount of quantity of load onto his body. He doesn't realize what he is doing, but he is only thinking that, wow, at the end of the day, my master will reward me. He will give me this, he will give me that. But at the end of the day, he gets nothing but being bitten by more and more sticks. So he doesn't make any profit for himself, but he's like a foolish animal working for someone else. And we also are in the same way, same way that we work for somebody, we hardly get anything, we get beaten up, we get bad words also, but we still have to work for the same company, same person. And for the as another characteristic is at the end of the whole day of hard work, even uh, the female a donkey, then he kicks her, kicks him, uh, when he follows her for sexual intercourse, which could be the case which, with many people. So now all of this, when we understand why are these examples given, to tell us two, three things. One is that the material enjoyment that you are going after is available in the animal bodies also. So material enjoyment cannot be your goal. Because if material enjoyment were to be your goal and if Krishna wanted that to become your goal, Krishna would have given you that kind of body. right? So I'll just draw your attention to this one or two points here. You just give me one moment. I'll not take much time of yours. Okay, so in 15.8 and 9, we have talked about this many times. I think in, in the Wednesday class also, I spoke about this one. The living entity in the material world carries his different conceptions of life, meaning the sexual desires or food and all that. These are conceptions of life from one body to another. Okay. And he takes one kind of body and again quits it to take another. Simple to understand. Then after taking this another gross body, he, he obtains a certain type of ear, eye, tongue, nose and sense of touch, which are grouped about the mind and he thus enjoys this. So what has Krishna done? That because you had certain desires, Krishna has given that person a kind of tongue, a kind of uh, sense, a kind of eye and ear or nose, so that he can fulfill that desire in a complete manner. So if you wanted to enjoy out of your blood, he will he would have made you a camel. Why would he make you a human being? But Krishna does not want us to do that. That's why he gave us a human body. And now what we are doing, we, despite the reason what he gave us the body for, we are not utilizing that body for that reason. We are utilizing it similar to a camel. So the next life, what are we telling Krishna? Ki, Baba, Krishna, you don't know what should you should give me. I know what I'm supposed to get. Because I have spent all my life enjoying sexual in, uh, intercourses, I should be getting... I want to enjoy out of my own blood, then please give me a body of a camel where I can eat my own blood. This is what we are communicating to Krishna. And that is what then he will do or give us in the next life. So Bhagavatam is teaching us here that do not find similarities between you and the other animals and behave accordingly. Instead of that, find out what is the distinguishing factor for your human life which is different from the animal bodies and then utilize it for the right purpose. That is the message that Bhagavatam is giving us here. Hare Krishna. Thank you so much. Any question for the philosophy? Oh, similar example was given in 7.15 about the asses and all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Correct, correct. Yeah. Either uh, uh, Srimad Bhagavatam mein, uh, in the fifth canto, fifth chapter where Lord Rishabdev starts uh, teaching to his sons. So, uh, the Bharat Maharaj was the son, right? So he says, you know, this verse is a beautiful verse. Nayam deho deha bhajam duruloke kashtan kaman arhati vid bhujam ye tapo divyam putraka yena sattvam shuddhe asmat brahma saukhyam ponantam. Beautiful verse it is. Lord Rishabdev told his sons 
my dear boys of all the living entities who have accepted material bodies in this world one who has been awarded this human form should not work hard day and night simply for sense gratification right so this is simple we have been given a human body for a certain purpose and there are certain other bodies who have been given that body for a certain purpose they they work day and night hard for their living we should not work hard that way why because this kind of sense gratification is available even for dogs and hogs that eat stool very important point the animal bodies like hogs they also derive sense gratification from what they eat even if they are eating stool one should engage in penance and austerity to attain the divine position of devotional service this is the purpose of human life and by such activity one's heart is purified and when one attains this position he attains eternal blissful life which is transcendental to material happiness and continues forever very you know, bhagavatam is full of fabulous verses up uh, meaning be, beyond our you know level of imagination hare krishna so we'll meet next week thank you is the pace okay are we doing too many verses uh, in a class shall we reduce it shall we keep same what do we do I mean, I'm seeing basically, especially yes, last week, uh, there were 12 verses and I felt sorry for Bandhu Baldev Prabhu. So that's why I'm asking. What are your thoughts? This is fine, Prabhu. Out, out of those 12, 13 verses, some 5, 6 were in just uh, one verse and uh, that yeah. there was not much to explain in that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Correct, correct. But still, I felt around 7, 8, 9 verses in a week is okay. 12 verses will be a bit too much. The, the next verse, verse number 20 is also fantastic. Yeah, we, we studied that in our Balutso classes for children also. Very beautiful verse. We'll see that tomorrow. Nehal Mataji, how are you? All okay? Are you feeling this is this space is good? The quality yes, of the presentation. Yes, Prabhuji. This is good, Prabhuji. I was able to understand even last uh, Saturday and even this Saturday. But the thing is what, you know, Prabhuji, I'm still very new to all these things. So whatever you are saying, it's as if first time for me. Okay. Okay. So I, I don't know. I mean, I've never heard it that this way in lectures form. So I, I'm able to understand whatever you and the other Prabhuji and all are saying, I'm able to understand. Okay. But I'm not able to retain much. No problem, Mataji. When we are studying for the first time, it happens in this way only. But you please continue coming. Uh, gradually, the matter will settle down in your heart and you will feel quite enlightened. It's just a yeah, matter I have, of... I have taken up uh, this translation, Pura book I have taken up okay. of around 931 pages. I downloaded and uh, I printed it and I'm, a, I'm reading it. And then when I'm reading, I'm able to connect. Okay, okay I've heard this. I've heard this. Okay. Good Prabhuji, I wanted written information about this, uh, this, uh, the site that you are using, Veda Base. Ah. How, how are we supposed to download it? Because on phone it is not coming. Mataji, this is a website, so you have to use it through the browser. But there are other apps also. I will send the link to the group. So, you can read the different apps where you can read it. Okay, okay, Prabhuji. Okay, Mataji. Okay. Hey, Krishna, Thank please you. Thank you. Coming, Mataji. Please come. Keep, please keep coming. Yes, yes. I'm going to come because I want to know more about it. Thank you so much. I'm trying to know more about it. Okay, Mataji. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Thank Hare you. Krishna. Hare Krishna. Let's meet, meet next week. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Thank you, Prabhuji. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Prabhuji. Thank you, Prabhuji. Thank you, Prabhuji. Thank you, Prabhuji.